Good morning. Welcome back as we take a look at our Old Testament reading for this past Sunday. Micah chapter 6, verses 1 to 8. And, oh, there's so much here. Um, as, as we take a listen, yes, of course, there's the final verse where, where he's, you know, we hear, He has told you, O man, what is good and what, the, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Um, be cautious because um, for approximately a hundred years now, um, with the rise of liberation theology, basically, um, and, and now especially within society with this idea of social justice, and so many liberal groups will basically take social justice and parachute it into the text, which is not at all what Micah is talking about, or the Lord throughout you know, the whole Old Testament. There are certain social things that we ought to be aware of in relationship that are there in Scripture, taking care of our neighbors and these sorts of things. But, but it's not really what's being talked about. We need to hear those words in biblical context. And as we hear this, um, you know, it really does build on what we heard on Sunday with the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit. All these little things, these humble things, those things that look like foolishness in the world and society, where the wisdom of God is revealed. But then especially the way in which, you know, Paul, as we heard yesterday um, from 1 Corinthians, that theology of the cross where in Jesus' death, um, it's not all of the sophistication and wisdom that we sometimes try to present before God, that, that where our salvation is found, it's in Jesus' death, in his resurrection, in Christ himself, in Christ alone that we have, you know, that, that, that righteousness, wisdom, sanctification, and redemption. So, because that's where Jesus brings to nothing all of these things that we have. As we dig into our reading from Micah, we do get an Old Testament example of the Lord's thundering and preaching where the Lord speaks and, and, and basically brings to nothing all of the ways in which we ourselves um, try to build our own um, case for our own righteousness. And you know what, as we listen to that, it, it, it is so common, Not was not only there in, in Paul's time, but even throughout our own world, even throughout the 1500s where, where Luther was active, even in the 400s together with Augustine and all of these other people, this becomes part of the, the human struggle and, and you know, our, our spiritual life, learning to, to allow ourselves to be brought to nothing so that we can be filled with that wisdom that comes from God and that strength and that life all through the forgiveness of our sins. Let's open with a word of prayer. Lord, as we come closer to the end of our Epiphany season and step more and more into our Lenten season, open our ears to hear those words where you do call us to repentance and where you do speak in ways in order to Take those self-made ways of, in which we so easily try to present our lives before you as, as somehow worthy of your salvation so that you can, you can bring them to nothing um, all through your word, but not in order to crush us and leave us there, but in order to lift us up by your strength. As we step into this, this reading from Micah, um, bless us so that we hear those words, not merely directed to people of old, but also even to the people and to we ourselves in our own generation here today. This we pray for in the name of your Son, our Savior, the one who died for us in order to raise us up. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. All right, let me find my glasses. Hear what the Lord says. So these are the words that the Lord says. Arise and plead your case. And so here now he's speaking to us as people and even to all of creation. Arise, plead your case before the mountains and let the hills hear your voice. This is sort of like what we heard in, in Job where the Lord thunders from, ultimately against all of those so-called friends that, that are there to, to crush Job and or to try and tell Job what to do in order to get his life back on track. You know, that self-help form of Christianity that we have even in our world today. And <clears throat> basically he thunders from the clouds and tells them, you know, you guys are off to lunch. But then also when, when Job, even after all of it, in his, his victimhood, if, you, if we want to use a modern day analogy, um, tries to argue for his, in his own defense before the Lord, you know, the Lord thunders from the clouds and says, clouds and says, where were you 
when the morning stars sang together. Where were you when I created the world and told the waters this far and no further? Do you know these things? You know, do you know when, you know, all of these different things happen? And tell me if you can, the way he says. Well, this is a similar kind of a thing where the Lord thunders through Micah against the people that were there um, after the exiles. And, and, and basically we hear these words and they're important for us as well. So that as, as the good Lord thunders, he, he basically tries to bring us back to that true wisdom, which starts with um, the way Proverbs is written, the fear of the Lord is the beginning, beginning of wisdom. So humility before God. And humility, um, the way we heard yesterday from 1 Corinthians 1, um, before God on the cross, where he gives himself into death for us and our salvation. So here, arise, plead your case before the mountains and let the hills hear your voice. It's like a court scene, okay? Plead your case if you can, okay? Tell me. Hear, you mountains, the indictment of the Lord. And so he basically here, it's like the Lord calls on creation itself, the mountains, the hills, in order to, you know, like they're the jury along the way. And hear the indictment of the Lord and you enduring foundations of the earth, for the Lord has an indictment against his people and he will contend with Israel. Okay, these words are spoken specifically to the household of faith. Okay. And it's not that these words don't apply outside of that to humanity as a whole, because Paul makes that very clear and throughout his writings. And even Isaiah makes it very clear that, you know, the, com the coming of a Savior and that message is for them as well. Return to the Lord, for he is gracious and merciful. Joel, okay, all of these sorts of things. But here in Micah, he's specifically grappling with the people of Israel who kept saying, well, it's because of these things, and if we just do better we just follow the law, if we just make sure that we don't get close to breaking the law and in terms of an external sense based on our own wisdom, which became all part of the rabbinical tradition that Jesus was contending with in the New Testament time period with the Pharisees where they made all of these laws so that they wouldn't show kindness to the people around them because the laws were there, okay, human-made laws. He's not talking about divine laws. He's talking about human-made laws. Well, here he says, okay, got the world, the earth, and its foundations as witness, and I've got a case against you, my people. And as a result, as we listen to these words, these words are for us as Christians in this world as well. And here's the interesting thing, because starting with the next verse, and I'm planning on hoping maybe using this on Good Friday, because on Good Friday, these words are used as a part of what's called the reproaches. After the cross is brought forward, and, and from, from beside or behind the, uh, the cross, pastor chants these words as though these, uh, you know, with God basically bringing this indictment against his people, against us. And that's followed by a prayer sung by a choir, and then the congregation joins in singing, Lamb of God, pure and holy. So that as we go from the Old Testament, the judgment of the law that we all fall under, and then this prayer offered by the choir we take refuge in Christ, in Christ alone, who is our Savior, Lamb of God, pure and holy. But beginning with this verse, verse 3, O oh my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. And these words begin with the three reproaches on Good Friday. Which, and So as the Lord says, what have I done to you that you are, are you know, um, you know, dragging this out and trying, you know, and, and keep the, keep in mind, you know, as parents, you know, you know your kids have done something wrong, so they call them in and you're waiting for them to fess up and then they come and string the story and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. It's like, okay, yeah, yeah. So you're, you're wearying me, that sort of a thing. Before the Lord, you know, it's funny, we try to do the same thing. Well, it's not really, no, not because of that. Well, and it's because so-and-so did such and such to me, so it's not really my fault, or the devil made me do it. Um, that's not as common anymore. People will joke about that as though it was something to joke about within popular culture nowadays. But then you've got all kinds of different things. Well, and I deserve to act like this, and so, and, and, and you know, there's reasons why I act like this, and all these sorts of things, rather than admitting that we're simply broken and standing before the Lord and saying, Lord, have mercy. What have I done to you, says the Lord? How have I wearied you? Answer me. And then he starts to go through this list, gospel list, saying, For I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, 
So here, and, and before you start saying, well, this is all such a patriarchal text, notice Miriam is in there as well. So that the good Lord sent before the people Moses as this great leader, Aaron as this priest, and then Miriam as this this uh, as a leader within the women where where she had um, a prophetic role within the people of Israel back then. And he says, remember, what have I done? For, you know, why, why are you wearying me? I saved you out of slavery. Okay, I did this for you. This is gospel work. I claimed you to be my people. And here, how look how you've treated me. I gave you all of these leaders. Oh, my people, remember what Balak, the king of Moab, devised, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him, and what happened from Shittim and Gilgal, that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. The story about Balaam and, and Beor is an interesting one, and uh, those of you who know me over COVID, I was, I had found myself a mask with a donkey on it, and it all goes back to the story in the book of Numbers, where, where, um, where basically the king of Moab, Balak, had Israel wandering through his territory and he knew that the Lord was with them. So he was trying to find someone to speak a curse against the people. So here you've got Balaam, this prophet for hire, where you have the, he had that kind of a thing in, in that day and age, in the same way that, you know, people nowadays say, if you just give me this much money, I will speak a good word and blessing for you and you'll get your healing and miracle. Hogwash. But here, basically, he hires Balaam in order to go. And he's not a prophet of the Lord, but the Lord speaks to him and says, no, you're not going to do that. And so and Balak gets a little upset at him. And this is where Balaam, remember the story, he's riding on a donkey. And the donkey keeps going up against the, the rocky crags so that Balaam's uh, legs get crushed. And he gets so upset at the donkey. And so he gets off the donkey and starts to beat the donkey, saying, why are you doing this to me? Sort of like the reproaches. Oh, my people, what have I done to you? But the Lord opens the mouth of the donkey and speaks through the donkey to Balaam and says, don't you see the angel in the road? And then his eyes were open, so he saw this angelic messenger standing before him to prevent him from going further. Um, it, it, fascinating story, fascinating account, where as we hear this, all of these things where the Lord is drawing on these things have redeemed you. I saved you from those curses, and instead I brought you through the land of Moab into the land of, you know, Israel, your homeland, all in safety as we hear all of this. I did this for you. And then as we go on with, what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the God on high? Shall I come before him and <clears throat> uh, with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? All of these sorts of things along the way where all of a sudden, you know, God says, you know, this is what I've done. So how am I going to respond? Is it going to be with all of these grand works? Even though we remember through the prophets and even the Psalms, the Lord doesn't desire all of these things. He desires a contrite heart, a broken and contrite heart, a humility, repentance. Okay. This is where this is going. Okay. This is where justice comes together. It's not social justice where we try to recreate the world in our own image based on what we think is the latest sense of wisdom and how, to, how we're going to fix all the problems in the world, even though we leave this grand wake of destruction behind us. It's kind of funny how that works. Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, ten thousands of rivers of oil? And then the next one, which is kind of a shout out both to, well, Abram, where he goes to sacrifice Isaac, the Lord rescues that only son of Abram, but then also ultimately in the sense where God does give his firstborn for our salvation. Shall I give my firstborn from my transgression, for my, tra for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? There's the gospel reflection pointing to Christ. With all of this, where God desires an open heart in humility before him. That's what repentance is. In the middle of all of these sorts of things where we try to present ourselves and say, now that I've, now I've done enough. Or the way that I preached in church 
the previous Sunday, where repentance, repentance, the way in which we stylize repentance based on worldly or earthly images, where I beat myself up until I don't feel so so much ashamed or guilty, or at least I've satisfied everybody else's sense of vengeance and around me, so that they they're 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 you know satisfied with how much I've, I've wept or, or or groveled before them that somehow that makes me worthy to come back to the Lord to receive forgiveness again. That's the exact opposite of what Scripture says. Repentance is repentance is allowing Christ to bring us to nothing with transparent humility, which says, I can't, but my Lord and my Savior has, and he does, and he calls me to be washed in that forgiveness, not because I've beat myself up, not because I've um, somehow done things extra to somehow, um, you know, cover over what my sins have been in the past, as though we can do that. We can't. You know, that was part of the medieval Catholic sense of works of supererogation. In other words, in other words, because you've sinned, you have to undo your sin, and by undo, and, and you can actually do more. So if you do these specific works, you can not only cover and undo your past sins, but potentially do extra sins so that you have extra good works to hand on to others once you make your way into purgatory, all of these sorts of things, um, none of which is in Scripture. Um, it may kind of help us to calm our conscience, you know, in terms of a worldly way of looking at things, but it's not the salvation that has been worked and given in Christ. So that as we hear all of these things, you know, the Lord says, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. Because look at all of these things that I've done to rescue you. Look at all of these things that I've done to protect you. Look at all of these things that I've done in the post-New Testament to save you in Christ. And yet we keep falling back to all of these different ways where we think that we are going to earn our salvation, which really separates us from Christ. That one firstborn son, the fruit of our Lord's own being, God's own being, so that the way as Paul describes him, John describes him as the word made flesh and dwelt among us, or Paul where the fullness of the deity dwells in him in bodily form. Again, that beautiful phrase where it's worth pausing and grappling with. We're here with Jesus. God is present and he does this work for you. He, the Lord, has told you, O man, what is good. So here's the commandments. He's the one that's told us. And this is why we don't and, and dare not get caught up in this, this trend to try and read social justice into this as opposed to you know, God's word of justice, where ultimately God's justice not only is shown in the way in which we ought to care to one care for one another, kindness, you love your neighbor as yourself, but then also God's justice is revealed in that wisdom from the cross, the way we heard yesterday with Paul in 1 Corinthians, where he himself dies for us. That's God's justice, which looks like foolishness to the world. It's foolishness to a lot of the social gospel and social justice kinds of messages in our world here today where we have to make reparations for everything rather than, rather than um, learning to humble ourselves before one another, recognizing that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God so that it's not that we don't take care of people around us, but stop trying to make the way in which we beat ourselves up as a way of showing our righteousness before God, because that don't work. That don't work. So he has told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, Blessed are the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers. 
Okay? All of these things which show up as a gift of God's working in our lives. Blessed are those who show mercy, God's mercy, reflect that divine mercy towards others, where we take on to ourselves the brokenness of our situation, humbly being honest about it, and live the kindness of Christ and forgiveness towards one another. Not vengeance, not anger, not fearfulness, not control, but mercy. This is the justice and the kindness and the humility that the Lord requires of us. So that as we continue our step into 2023 and, and tying all of these readings together for this weekend is so such a beautiful um, message, but also a challenging message for us. Um, it, it's a reminder for us to build on Christ and on the cross of Christ and on the goodness of God rather than all of the ways in which we try to present ourselves as so good before the Lord. So that we really do build on that gift and that source and that place and that, 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 that wonderful reality of salvation, which even now um, we get to participate in all through the word, all through the sacraments, all through the Holy Supper of our Lord. So, Good words to chew on. All right. The Lord bless you. And um, you know, may the Holy Spirit let these, let these words of Scripture sink into your lives um, deeper and deeper so that we grow, grow together as his people, grow together as the church baptized into the flesh of Christ, into the body of Christ, but also grow together as, as witnesses to that same gospel in our own day and age. Amen.